Sonny Rollins is saying, in my mind, I haven't done enough. And wow. <laughs> Hi, welcome along to today's vlog. Last night I was back in London uh, doing a gig on a boat again. Back for this gig on HMS President. I spoke about it last year, but the big thing I forgot to take with me is Vaseline. Three pounds for this Vaseline. It's an absolute rip-off, but it means at least my lips will survive tonight's gig. Quite frankly, I still think that Vaseline was a rip-off, but absolutely vital at this time of year while it's cold for all you saxophone players and keeping those lips nice and clean and without cracks, which is really, really important. What I wanted to talk about today was this article that I found. It's quite an old one, actually. It goes back to 2000, 2005. It's Joshua Redman interviewing Sonny Rollins, and I haven't really done one of these type of commentary videos for a long time, but I thought it would be really interesting. I really enjoyed rereading the article. I sent it out on my Three Bullet Wednesday email. If you're not on my Three Bullet Wednesday email listing, head over to cambridgesaxophone.com and sign up there for the four free lessons and you'll also get uh, my Wednesday email. It's just kind of three bullet points, three things I've found about saxophone playing, maybe a free lesson, maybe an idea, a transcription, something like that. Not as in depth as my Saturday email, which is for my online students, but the Wednesday email is just a kind of keep in touch, nice, brief, nice, short and sweet email. So if you wanna be up for that, Make sure you subscribe below and also subscribe to the channel because that's really, really important because obviously then you get to know about videos because YouTube doesn't always tell you when new videos come out and make sure you click the bell button. That makes a difference. Uh, it means that you know exactly when I've put out a new video. So back to this Sonny Rollins and Joshua Redman article, Joshua Redman's interview of Sonny Rollins. One of the things we all enjoy reading interviews by our heroes or by people who've done well, think about um, the Tools for Titans book or um, uh, Tools of the Titans and... What was the other one that Tim Ferriss did? Tribe of Mentors, that was it. <laughs> one of the things that makes those books by Tim Ferriss so compelling is we're always trying to look for that secret ingredient. We're always trying to, want to we want to find out what makes these great players, these great entrepreneurs, these great sports people tick. What, what's the secret that they've got that the rest of us haven't? And it's even better, I feel, when you've got someone like Joshua Redman, who is a phenomenal player in his own right, interviewing someone of the caliber of Sonny Rollins. So I wanted to highlight a few things from the interview. Uh, one of the things is the second question Joshua asks Sonny, which is, you know, um, when you listen to those recordings of Sonny Rollins when he's just 20, he's only been playing the saxophone at that point for 10 years. And it's just incredible how good he is. And, and Redmond's like, kind of like, you must have been a child prodigy, you know, you must have had that thing. But it's really, really noticeable what Sonny says. He says, you're very, very kind. I just practiced a lot. I practiced a lot because I love playing and I practice all day long. My mother used to have to come and call me to come and eat dinner because I was there practicing all the time. And then of course, Josh asked the question we're all trying to find out, which is, you know, what were you practicing at the time? You know, what was making it tick? And Rollins says, I remember my saxophone book. I had a Ben Verrecken book. It was very famous at the time, but as far as what I was practicing, I was always a stream of consciousness player playing for hours by myself. I think that's why I relate to a lot of these so-called free players. The next thing then Joshua says, one of the things I really learned from you is this sense of flow as a nar narrative, as an improviser. You're able to be completely spontaneous in the stream of consciousness. Um, and since I know that you've talked about this, this is a thematic improviser, is this something you've thought about? And he says, no, I never really thought about it. I didn't think about it beyond what I'm saying now. You know, you can spend too much time thinking about what you're gonna play, it comes out so fast. The fact is, there's, the fact that there's a logic to what I'm playing, I've been very blessed about that because I certainly didn't think about doing it, okay? So there's very much, there's been questions asked in the Q&A before, what do I think about when I'm improvising? And the problem is, if I think when I'm improvising, it doesn't end up being that, that good, really. Last night on this gig, uh, we were on, I was on with a gig with a singer, which I haven't done this type of gig for a long time, function band, well, it's jazz, sorry, uh, a jazz gig led by a singer, and you're playing things like Fly Me to the Moon in B major, and uh, just kind of playing in all sorts of weird keys that you're not used to playing in. Um, and it's very difficult, I found it last night, to start coming out with really great streams of consciousness ideas, mainly because you're not doing that all the time, you're not practicing it, 
and it's not really something I enjoy if I'm truthfully honest. Another good question again that comes out in a lot of the Tim Ferriss books, maybe something a lot of us, and it kind of feeds into what I was just saying then, one of the Joshua Redman asked this question, he says, one thing that I've noticed is over the past decade, uh, you found a way of limiting the amount you record. Remember this is back to 2005 before Sonny had to take a break from performing because of his health. Um, you know, Joshua says here, obviously it's something you've been conscious of doing because I'm sure if you wanted to, people are asking you to perform and record every day of the week. How important is it being for you to, to be able to grow as a musician or just have peace as a human being to kind of limit your activities? And Sonny talks about his late wife was one of the things that handled his uh, business things. He says, I'm not going to play someplace just because of the money. I was interested in doing something that had a certain dignity. The club wasn't too funky. It had a dressing room. Later on, we decided to stop playing clubs and only play concerts. These were career decisions that were deliberate that tied into the fact that I didn't want to live a certain kind of life and to be a certain kind of person. And I don't want to sound too self-serving here. And I think one of the things, and you can delve down into the interview, don't forget, it's linked below. Um, I think Sonny knew the dangers. Sonny had had problems with addiction and knew the dangers of playing clubs and, and kind of what had gone, had gone on. And of course, Sonny had lived through the bit where jazz, especially the bebop movement, had moved through the clubs. Um, and he makes that conscious decision to play concerts, so it means concert halls, no longer clubs, and, and to kind of do, to make that decision about what he's going to play, which means he's not going to earn as much money as he could possibly do, but he's going to be happier, he's going to have a peace about his life that he's going to um, enjoy. And then Josh asks about the, you know, the very famous sabbatical on the bridge, I've referred to it in this video. Um, but Sonny says, well, for both, my music and my personal life are the same thing. There were times when I specifically wanted to get away to do music, and there were times when I wanted to get away for the scene and get my personal life together. So each of those took precedent at certain sabbaticals. So I think definitely on the bridge sabbatical, Sonny's trying to get his music together, but there's also a, a second sabbatical, I think in the mid 70s, where Sonny went off to India and studied yoga and, and, and different spiritual disciplines and got away from playing music for a time. And then he says it comes back. The final thing I want to highlight, and again, you can go and read the interview yourself, is a question from Josh where he says, everything you've done musically over the years, everything you've done for the music, I can't imagine anything greater, but to hear those words come out of your mouth, it's inspiring because it makes you realize even for the greatest musicians, it's still an adventure, it's still a journey. And I want to highlight something I've heard from adult students in the past where they say, I feel like I'm never going to get to the end of the journey. And I'm like, you won't. The whole point is the journey. It isn't getting to the end. You are never going to be in this position, or you should never be in this position where you are totally satisfied about what you're playing. I haven't felt comfortable to say that I've reached my goal. If I did, I'd be happy maybe. I wouldn't be happy. Maybe then I'd be sad because I wouldn't have anything to strive for, but it hasn't happened. As you know, being a musician and a saxophone player, you may not know because you're young and strong and these things haven't affected you, but I still feel that I haven't got to what I want to get to. I'm really hoping I get there. But there's no doubt in my mind that I haven't done enough. I haven't gotten to something what, that I know is there. Sonny Rollins is saying, in my mind, I haven't done enough. And wow, that makes me feel a hell of a lot better because I certainly feel on many days I haven't done enough. I haven't done enough practice. I haven't done enough hustling. I'm not working hard enough. I'm not doing these kind of things. It's, it's, it's all part of being a musician, being an artist, being a creative, being a human, I guess, which is to keep striving to get better. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, really, really good. And then Josh says after that, uh, in the past, I felt I've been self-critical to a fault. I love playing music, but I'm so unhappy by the way that I play sometimes that I fear it becomes debilitating. And I found that a bit hard to say with someone of Joshua Redman saying that, but then Sonny says, well, that's good. There are a lot of guys out there who come out stage and boy, they get some applause. And they look at their fingers and say, wow, do these fingers, which is fine. But I've heard too much great music in my lifetime to phone it in. I know what's great and that's where I want to be. That's what I want to play and I'm going to keep trying as long as I'm able to. Read the testimonials at the end as well. They've got testimonials at the end of the interview from Wayne Shorter. You know, do you remember the first time you heard Sonny play? I'm really glad I rediscovered it. I'd saved it as a bookmark. I probably tweeted it years ago and, and uh, I'd seen it, but it's one of the best interviews I've ever read. Uh, with a jazz musician, so check it out.
So a slightly, a slightly longer vlog than I'm used to doing. A slightly longer vlog, I hope you'll forgive me for that today. Lots to explain in that interview. Um, but Tyreek Curry was absolutely delicious. And I'm back playing Giant Stones because I've got this 1959 Year the Change Jazz a series of concerts coming up. The first one is in Cambridge on March the 3rd, then we're in London on April the 15th. And there's going to be more dates coming up throughout the summer and into well, throughout the whole year, really celebrating 60 years since the most important year in modern jazz, certainly, and certainly a very pivotal year in the music. So, there's because Giant Steps was released 60 years ago this year, about 60 years ago next month, I think, if my memory serves correctly, um, people are going to ask me, people are going to expect it, so I've got to get on top of it. I've not changed necessarily my opinions, it's still a great exercise, it's still phenomenally difficult to do, and I certainly can't play anywhere near as quickly as I could play 12 years ago, but uh, just getting around some of those cold train ideas are fantastic. Don't forget to check out uh, my last vlog here, this is what I was up to this time last year, that subscription button is really important, so please make sure you press it. Thank you very much for watching, I'll see you really soon, bye bye. I have to have my main meal on a Thursday at lunchtime because I have teaching all the evening until very, very late, which is great. Really, really pleased, really pleased to have all um, my students means I don't get a chance to eat till really, really late. And my, one of my biggest problems, by the way, do you guys like the new grey jumper? Uh, one of the biggest, I shouldn't hold you under the flipping hood, should I? One of the hard, well, let's get the sh washing out of the way. Uh, one of the diff most difficult problems I have is um, making sure I eat at a sensible time. So like yesterday on the gig, didn't eat, I was kind of air off the trays that were going past and oh, it's just bad, you just eat junk food, you don't really know how much you're eating. So trying always, Good times. A slightly longer vlog, I hope you'll forgive me for that today. Lots to explain in that interview. Uh, Tyro curry was absolutely delicious. And I'm back playing Giant Stats because I've got this 1959, the year that changed jazz, a series of concerts coming up. The first one is in Cambridge on March the 3rd, then we're in London on April the 15th. And there's gonna be more dates coming up throughout the summer and into, well, throughout the whole year, really celebrating 60 years since the most important year in modern jazz, certainly, and certainly a very pivotal year in the music. So. There's, because Giant Steps was released 60 years ago this year, in fact, 60 years ago next month, I think, if my memory serves correctly, um, people are going to ask for it, people are going to expect it, so I've got to get on top of it. I've not changed necessarily my opinions. It's still a great exercise. It's still phenomenally difficult to do, and I certainly can't play it anywhere near as quickly as I could play it 12 years ago, but uh, just getting around some of those cold train ideas are fantastic. Don't forget to check out uh, my last vlog here. This is what I was up to this time last year. That subscription button is really important, so please make sure you press it. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you really soon. Bye-bye.